Okay, I think I've got it. This is how I would cast the movie of this book with just adult animation cartoon characters. Paul Booth, obvious Eric Cartman, which makes Liz Booth Mrs. Cartman. For McCandless, gotta go with Brian from Family Guy, but I'm gonna cheat and have him be Brian from Family Guy voiced by Matt Christman from Chapo Trap House. Uh, Billy Vorker, Old Gil from The Simpsons, easy. Mrs. McCandless, with a cameo from Mallory Archer, R.I.P. Jessica Walter. And finally, Lester, I'm gonna go with Roger the Alien. No? Klaus the Fish from American Dad. I can't remember which American writer it was. I heard him speak and he said uh, that his job is to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. Friends, enemies, indifferent ones, welcome to Books You Haven't Read. My name is... it's blank. And today I want to talk about uh, Carpenter's Gothic by William Geddes. Now I have read both J.R. and uh, The Recognitions before, okay? So here's the typical size of a William Geddes novel. And then we got this little fella. But Carpenter's Gothic was a really important novel for Gaddis's career. It was considered kind of the commercial breakthrough for him. Now he had come off of just winning a MacArthur in, I think, 1982, and J.R. had gotten him the National Book Award. And so this sold really well, uh, no doubt probably because it was shorter. And I imagine that if you're coming to this review, you're probably coming for one of two reasons. Either the big Gaddis intimidates you and you want to know if the smaller stuff is worth it, or you've read the good shit and now you want to know if the minor stuff is just as good. JK, it's not shitty. It just feels very contra gaddis y because, you know, this is the guy that writes tomes, and so this is a much more normal novel length. Uh, I actually like to think of it as Gaddis does a bottle episode because the whole uh, novel exists or takes place in just the one house. I want to get into this novel by talking about both the title and the cover. Um, a carpenter gothic, non-possessive, is a type of house, and specifically it's the type of house where the entirety of the novel's action takes place. This house is also based on uh, William Gaddis's own carpenter gothic house that he owned um, somewhere up in upstate New York. Now, original Gothic architecture, uh, you can think of as uh, like churches from the Middle Ages. That was the style Gothic architecture, uh, and it was usually made out of stone. A carpenter Gothic is a wood house that attempts to mimic that style. They're basically based on the proportions of two by fours. The side elevation is uh, 18 centimeters high. Bjarka, it's a book channel. Not everything is architecture and Legos, you dork. You can say in the, in the building industry, everything somehow seems to be saturated with the measurements of Lego. And a big theme of this book is mimicry, or imitation with lesser materials, or uh, a degradation of the real. And this is a theme, you might almost think of it as like a meta theme, because it reinforces the idea that uh, the book itself is a minor work, right? It's Gaddis but less. A carpenter gothic is a house that's designed for its exterior symmetry, uh, but that is sort of figured out interiorly after the fact. Another motif of this novel, you could say, is uh, confused interiority masked by exterior symmetry. This novel really is a parody of the gothic novel, and uh, it uses a lot of similar elements, uh, whether that's the woman in distress, uh, the tyrannical husband, mysterious stranger, locked room, as well as a lot of really distinct uh, kind of gothic imagery. Uh, lots of uh, dead trees that look like bones, lots of crows or ravens, uh, bleak landscapes, misty fog, things like this. As with J.R., the conversations are really vernacular, uh, but the narration of the novel, which uh, the, there's not a lot of narration, but when it does happen, it's very dreamy and ornate, and clashes in style very much with the way in which people speak. Now, as for the cover, we have got, this is a little dark, but um, we've got Goya's Witches in Flight, okay? And uh, we've got the three witches up here uh, who are naked and levitating uh, and wearing uh, what are called korotsa. Uh, those are like the hats that are usually associated with witches. And they're about to devour or, you know, maybe suck the blood of uh, this guy right here. Uh, and those karotsas, those hats, they're actually, they've got two prongs on them. The normal witch's hats would be, you know, like one prong, but 
These two prongs are meant to invoke what are called maters, uh, which is that kind of hat. It's M-I-T-R-E-S. It's the kind of hat that uh, bishops would wear, and it's a close, cloaked way of associating the Spanish clergy uh, with the witches that they hate. Basically, the Inquisition is, is so loathsome as to earn the disdain and ire uh, that they reserve themselves for witches. And down below, we have three figures. You really can't see the donkey, except if you're looking at a a higher resolution picture than this. But we've got the donkey, which is a typical symbol for ignorance. And then we've got these two fellas. Uh, and this guy has got his ears covered with his head buried in the sand. Uh, and then this guy, uh, or it could be a woman, I don't know, has a cloak over their head uh, and is covering their eyes and is also making uh, a sign to ward off the witches. And so at first, you know, we have kind of the lower echelon, the lower class of society, uh, willfully engaging in a kind of ignorance for the upper class of society. But this book is very much an indictment on the priestly class of America, and that priestly class is often tied to imperial or capitalistic exploits. And this is one of the things that drives the character of McCandless crazy, is the willful ignorance that people have chosen to uh, engage in, and the fact that it is encouraged by the upper echelons of society. Encouraged and nurtured, I should say. Now as for the plot, I actually kind of want to talk about that least, um, because this is a book that makes you work to put the plot together, and I want to preserve kind of that reading experience. Uh, there are only seven chapters in the book, and they all take place, as I said, in the Carpenter Gothic house. Uh, but the events of the novel span the globe. So first we have Liz McCandless, uh, and she is our protagonist, and gothic woman in distress, and she is an heiress to a mining company baron. Now her husband Paul is a Vietnam vet who used to be kind of the bag man for this company. He's like the Michael Cohen to Liz's father's company. Uh, but ever since Mr. Voriker, Liz's father, uh, died by suicide, he got fired from the company and is now trying to establish himself as like the director of media or a media consultant for a character named Reverend Uda. As for Reverend Uda, who we never actually meet in the novel, he's an American evangelical pastor uh, who has a prominent radio station in Africa where he's, you know, kind of doing his mission work, but that mission work is all kind of a cover to uh, angle in on the Voriker's mining interests. Then you've got Billy, Liz's brother, and Billy is just like a classic fail son who's bumbling his way through life, uh, and he is living off the scraps of the trust that his father has left for him, as are Liz and Paul, hence Paul's desire to work with Reverend Uda. And then finally, you've got Mr. McCandless, uh, who owns the house and is renting it out to the booths, uh, Paul and Liz, and he is a geologist who has surveyed the land in question in Africa of the mining interests. So that should give you a good preview of like the conflicts and tensions that these characters have uh, with each other. But again, I want to leave kind of the figuring out for the plot uh, for the actual reading experience itself. For now, I want to talk about uh, just kind of my personal reaction to this novel, uh, or at least the part that stayed with me. And this is the part that might contain mild spoilers. So some background. Um, I read in a couple places online that uh, McCandless was a sort of cutout character for Gaddis, and that this is something that Gaddis claimed in a letter to Stephen Moore. Um, and I recently got a copy of the letters of William Gaddis, and I couldn't find this in any of the Carpenter's Gothic section of his letters. So I just went straight to the source. Um, Stephen Moore's email is publicly available, and I asked him about it, uh, and he clarified that this was something that Gaddis told him uh, in person when he read the first draft of the novel. And uh, one of the other cool things that Stephen Moore said was that he noticed that McCandless's speech patterns and Gaddis's speech patterns were nearly identical. So William Gaddis is a very good self-mimic, apparently. Okay, with that in mind, I want to read a passage. This is a portion of a monologue by Liz Booth, and it comes from page 243. I'll read it and then give my reaction to it afterwards. Because you're the one who wants it, she said abruptly, in a voice so level he stopped, simply looking at her, at the glass coming up in her hand, and her head thrown back to the last of what was in it, the full swell of her throat rising in the hollowed arch of her jaw's line, hard as bleached bone, as he'd seen it only once before. And it's why you've done nothing, she put down the glass, to see them all go up like that smoke in the furnace, all that stupid, ignorant, blown up in the clouds, 
and there's nobody there, there's no rapture, no anything. Just to see them wiped away for good, it's really you, isn't it? That you're the one who wants apocalypse, Armageddon, all the sun going out and the sea turned to blood, you can't wait, no, you're the one who can't wait. The brimstone and fire and your rift like the day it really happened because they, because you despise their, not their stupidity, no, their hopes because you haven't any, because you haven't any left. And so here is McCandless and he has all this knowledge and he's smarter than every character and he recognizes all their moral failings and he's read every book and he knows what book to recommend to each character and the thing that really hit me was that you can have all this intellect, but you can still have the same dark heart that you despise in others, right? You are not immune to what you criticize in other people. And the way in which I've seen this kind of play out in myself and my own life is uh, with COVID, right? So at this point, you know, all the people that are dying, the vast majority of the people that are dying from COVID are the unvaccinated um, and people that uh, were denying the reality of this disease or uh, the effectiveness of the vaccines. And there's a part of me that I read these headlines and on a daily basis, I just think, yeah, you get what you deserve. And it's not just the thought, it's not just that dark thought, it's the quickness with which I make that dark thought. It's that it's automatic, that it's an impulse, right? And that angry, uh, a pyrrhic sense of me is something that, you know, I think I recognize that I share with people that I don't like. Uh, I have this desire to see people be destroyed by their own hubris. You know, ultimately you can feel uh, as smart and superior as, as you want, but the joke is still on you, right? Because McCandless is uh, a character trapped in a, a mean and stupid world that, uh, often feels contrived and doomed in equal measure. And this is Gaddis's way of saying, hey, don't forget about me. I'm an asshole too. And I don't know, uh, an author making fun of himself is, you know, one of the highest virtues possible, I think. There's a lot I didn't get to in this book. Uh, again, I wanna kind of preserve that putting together the plot part of the novel that uh, I think is so much fun to do. Um, because a lot of the action of this novel is sort of casually tossed in the margins of conversation between characters. And if you've never read Gaddis before, uh, I think it's a good uh, muscle, a good reading muscle to try and strengthen is, is sort of putting together uh, the plot with just the little scraps that, uh, that you get. My recommendation would be to start with the longer Gaddis, the Recognitions, JR, whichever sounds more interesting to you, because I think that's the truer Gaddis. However, this is a, a good accessible starting point if you're intimidated by the length of it. Thanks for watching. Two special shout outs. Thanks to Stephen Moore for answering my email at 11 p.m. on a Saturday night. And uh, thanks to Orpheus for uh, selling me a copy of The Letters of William Gaddis, uh, which was a really good reading companion um, with this book. I'm hoping to uh, use it as well when I get to A Frolic of His Own, which will hopefully be sometime later this year. End of the video. My hate is pure in the Alexander Coburn sense. I really do hate them all. I can't not hate them. Maybe that's bad. Maybe I shouldn't hate him. Maybe that proves that there's some sort of dark heart within me, you know? I'm like Lenin, you know, give me control of the state and I'm gonna start doing purges and, you know, creating the fucking checkup. We should all have a chance, you know? People suck, but we all deserve a chance to suck. We get pulled out of nothing. We get pulled out of the ether into consciousness that we did not ask for. You're shot out of oblivion into consciousness, and you will either be cursed or blessed based on the whim of genes and geography. And then we are set loose in a world where we are going to have a very brief, finite amount of time to love and be loved and to experience think and to exist before that's snuffed out. That is something that every single one of us shares. That is a unifying human experience.
experience. That's all we have.